Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on Marketing. If you haven't already done so, please visit ProRelevant.com and sign up for all of these episodes and podcasts. I am the author of the newly released book, The Post-COVID Marketing Machine, Prepare Your Team to Win. And you can find more information on this at marketingmachine.prorelevant.com. There are so many decisions that marketers need to make. And uh, should they spend on paid digital, paid social, on sales, and what have you? And how do they all work together? And whether you're a small or a large marketer or even a startup, getting this mix right will drive significant incremental sales. And today I'm interviewing Josh Sweeney, who is an entrepreneur's marketer. So he knows how to help out that entrepreneur to get that mix right, to do the right things and the right things first and uh, go from there. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Josh. Josh Sweeney is a seasoned entrepreneur whose mission is to help founders increase revenue so that they can have a positive impact on their team, their family, and the community. He delivers on that mission by helping founders go from founder revenue to that all-important thing called scalable revenue. Josh, welcome. So good to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, so tell us your backstory in marketing. How did you get started in your career in marketing? Yeah, so I've I've had a number of different corporate roles, but I would say it started when I launched my first CRM consulting firm. So I was in the CRM space for a large vendor and uh, our software provider, and then I launched my own professional services firm. And I spent about nine years doing you know CRM implementations. And the interesting thing about that and marketing is there's kind of two sides to the lessons and and what I learned in marketing while I was in that space. And the first side was what we did with clients. So a lot of these were custom CRM solutions that had heavy marketing integrations. Um, so we would be integrating with marketing automation, sentiment analysis. A lot of times they were large data hubs for you know signals and intelligence you would get from marketing for the salespeople. So that was one side, like seeing that in action um, all the way up to like the fortune 1000 level where we're doing it big data for a lot of companies or a lot of large companies. So that was part of it. And then I think the other half and the other side was growing my own sales and marketing. So in that organization, you know, over about nine years, I grew to a few million in revenue and then had my first exit. And when you're, when you're on that trajectory, you have to learn a lot of lessons about sales and marketing with your own dime, which is fundamentally different, you know, than, than implementing for somebody else with, with, you know, bigger budgets than maybe the revenue, the total revenue for your own company. Um, so, yeah, I think I got a lot of different angles on just sales and marketing in general. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there is a huge differences, uh, difference between uh, your money <laughs> and, right. uh, well, it's the company's money and it's a budget. I just need, need to be under budget and I'll be okay. Very, very different. So tell us a little bit about uh, founder scale. Sure. So as you mentioned earlier, uh, we help businesses go from founder revenue to scalable revenue. And the challenge we see is that in the majority of companies we work with that are founder led, um, the founder generates the majority of revenue in the company. And at some point, they need a transition out of that. Either growth is kind of flatlined, they're looking to exit in the next few years, they're looking for it to scale without so much involvement from them on the sales side. And what most founders come to find out is that transition is significantly more challenging than just going and finding a vendor to help you generate leads or whatever, whatever the other other misconceptions might be. And uh, so that's specifically the challenge we focus on with the founder companies that we work with. Yeah, and you are so right is, uh, you know, and I'm a founder of my company and, uh, and, and you as well. And it is, yeah. it is very hard to make that transition. And uh, so uh, sounds pretty good. So what do you see uh, uh, for a startup then how that is so different uh, making that transition maybe than somebody that's already there for a more of a mature business. Yeah, I would say the the kind of delta between the mature business and the startup, and I think you know context is going to matter. Most of our clients are business owners between like two and twenty million, but it can be very different for um, you know the startup depending on what that means to you, right? So people have different contexts for startups, but I think the main thing is is what numbers and capital is required to actually drive revenue. So there's a direct correlation, like after the founder 
has kind of exceeded their time and their ability to drive revenue, now you have to start spending money. And there's a direct correlation between what's being spent on sales and marketing and that revenue growth. But when you've been driving that revenue for a few months or a few years, there's there's kind of a you know, a disconnect between those two items. You, you've maximized all that you could do. So I think when on the smaller side, you know, figuring out how to drive revenue for yourself and then putting capital into play in order to grow um, is part of that journey. Whereas the larger companies, some of them already know that, right? The, if, you're a, if you're a $10 million company, you're already been at the point where you're putting capital in motion to drive revenue. So there's, there's different uh, dynamics at play if you're a startup, if you're kind of a small business, if you're a larger company. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and and actually going from just founder-led sales to uh, founder plus a sales team, there's like a step function of what you <laughs> have to invest, and and unfortunately, you've got to wait. You know, as much as you'd like to be able to hire a salesperson today and get revenue tomorrow, <laughs> uh, unless you were just absolutely wildly super super califragilistic, uh, uh, lucky, uh, that ain't going to happen. Right. You know, you're, you're going to be maybe if you're lucky three months, probably six months. And, and for a lot of founders, it might even be a year away. So, uh, very, very tough to make that transition. So, uh, what kind of mistakes do uh, founders make in, in marketing when they're trying to get their marketing going? So I think one of the mistakes we find is, you know, having, making sure the founders are, in general, like the mistake would be not spending enough time to understand how that capital drives revenue. So it's it's a lot more complex. So what we see a lot of founders do out of the gate, and um, these are some of our favorite customers, is they go out and they spend money first. And instead of, you know, spending four or $8,000 on understanding the strategy and talking through and, and, and really understanding how all the pieces fit together, they just jump in feet first. And so it's, it's a little bit of, um, I, I would say, you know, kind of an internal joke or something we joke around about is like a lot of founders would rather spend $40,000 to get going than $4,000 to talk about the strategy first. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's a little bit of a mistake and there's a lot of exercises that go into that. And, and there's reasons why we, you know, as founders do that, you know, a lot of times we're not sure if we're going to get value from those discussions. So it has to be the right company and the right person, you know, to spend that money on strategy. So I'd say that's one of the biggest mistakes that we see is, is just going in feet first and not really knowing the dynamics of how what you're going to spend is going to fit into that bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think not only that, uh, getting that strategy right, which is kind of what more business is about and certainly what your business is about is to really figure out, you know, what is going to work and then have a really good solid plan to execute on that. And, and I think, it, uh, you know, the other piece of that is also having the having the patience to wait for it to actually unfold as you're, as you're going through that, that the 4,000 and then after that, the 40, the 40,000 and hopefully the 400,000. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the different things that you're going to have to do as a founder in marketing, we find take a lot longer than the founders want to commit to. So um, an early time frame or a short time frame to them in kind of marketing in the marketing world is actually extremely short. So we'll hear <laughs> things like, well, I'm going to try this for 90 days. And if it works, I'll spend more money. And we're like, okay, we're already off track on how we're thinking about this. Like, <laughs> and there's instances where that can work, but most of the times that's not the case. And so that's where putting those numbers together, having really good conversations with somebody who understands how the founder has to grow their company and their challenges is different than, you know, an agency that works with larger companies, you know, that, that context is going to be key. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, and no question about it. And that's where a company like yourselves, founder scale, really focusing in on those kind of challenges and also aligning it, you know, that 90 days, uh, I'm surprised you even gave them 90 days. I thought it was like <laughs> nine days. <laughs> Sometimes it's 30 days. Yeah, we get 30 days. Like if, if we spend this much in 30 days, I'm like, nothing's going to happen. Nothing will happen <laughs> if you spend that much in 30 days. Like, yep. uh, you know, because there's a there's a context of to the founder and depending on the size, that sounds like a lot of money because it's much more than they're spending. You know, spending $1,000 for 30 days on ads sounds like a lot if you've if your context is zero. But in the grand scheme, we know like 
that you can't really get going for less than 3000 a month with somebody and probably another 800 minimum for somebody that's a professional to manage those, Mm -hmm. you know, so there are some minimums that we have to deal with and say, okay, a thousand dollars, maybe an R and D budget, but let's just go ahead and put an R and D label on it. Let's set the right expectations and let's do a debrief after and say, what did we learn? So that now we've had the conversation to go to somebody and spend more money. So there's reasons to do different things. And part of it is discovery and knowledge gaps and, you know, closing that knowledge gaps, uh, knowledge gap for the founder. Yeah. 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 It makes a lot of sense. So we've talked about some of the challenges and some of the misperceptions. What about some of the big successes? What are the, uh, what are their biggest successes? I think some of the biggest successes are they're they are maximizing every dollar, right? So because their bar is so high and the budgets are going to be lower than, you know, what a bigger agency or what organizations are spending, Founders are really good at doing a lot with a little and really driving and staying, you know, almost kind of myopic on these results, right? Driving revenue. And so that has, you know, long and short term consequences, but they're amazing at driving and maximizing every dollar, right? And cutting their losses and moving on um, sometimes a little too quickly, but, you know, you're learning at a very rapid pace. So getting a lot done with a little is, is probably one of the biggest successes we see across the board. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think they, uh, uh, you know, as a founder, especially when it's your money and uh, it's uh, your salary yeah. and it's your, uh, you know, whether you're going to get paid this month or whether uh, you're going to do some marketing this month, it, it is definitely something that the, the founder is going to want to know is working and is really delivering what they're, what they're expecting uh, to get out of it. I think that's also one of the challenges that uh, founders oh, have yeah. is that their first couple of customers are not that they're easy to win, but quite often they're friends and uh, people that they've known for quite a while. And so they really understand the uh, the infrastructure and the environment of their of these friends and first customers, but then getting them to that next step to where they're going to people that they may only marginally know or not know at all, and figuring out how to get to that you know that next uh, five customers or ten customers or whatever it happens to be. What kind of thoughts do you have there? Yeah, so we we look at it as kind of a complex a complexity curve. So we show our founders and say basically everything's going to get more expensive and more complex as your revenue goes up from a sales and marketing perspective. And in the early days, you get a little um, complacent. You can get complacent and that is your network. And we we call that kind of the freebie zone, right? You're, it's your network. You're going out and doing networking events. You're the most knowledgeable person. So they, they those deals almost come in for free. They come in very easily. And at some point we know that the founder is gonna plateau. There's, they They start running the business the business is growing. They have operational challenges that are now president, not head salesperson. And so the business plateaus and that's where it actually gets difficult. That's where you need to know how to deploy capital, what sales and marketing you're going to spend on. And also that's also at which point you're starting to convert over to competing with other people who are also spending those dollars. So it comes in, the, the deals start to become much harder to close and they get past the founder. And so that's kind of that journey that we're, we are always working on explaining is, you know, you're trying to get out of this freebie zone where things came fairly easy, plateaued, and now how do you grow out of that? And that's a challenging situation. Yeah, and especially too, when you're trying to um, uh, be the founder, and unfortunately, you know, like you said, you've got to be the president, not just the chief salesperson. And you now have to delegate selling and or marketing to uh, someone else who will never, ever know the product as good as you do. And, uh, and also will have a lot more difficulty making a decision as to how to structure the solution or what have you, depending upon what they're selling, but uh, how to structure the solution so it really makes sense for them. And, and so I could imagine there's a, not just a marketing component to that, but there's also a pretty big training component that has to be part of that. 
Yeah, it's definitely complex. And I would say it's even harder when you have like an expert founder in the services, like a services business or professional services, because they can kind of reach into their bag of tricks of 10 or 20 years of experience and say what needs to be said. Whereas when you bring on a new sales rep, even with industry experience there, you know, there's a reason that they're a sales rep and didn't probably go out and just found their own company, right? Um, so they may not have that level of experience or may not want those challenges that the founder takes on. And so for that sales rep, we have to really narrow down what they're pitching. So instead of the consultative pitching where they can pretty much sell anything and say, well, we do, we're a full service agency or we're a full service security firm or whatever it might be, you really have to box it in and say, get good at this positioning, get good at selling this package. Um, because selling everything is usually done best by the founder and that's hard to replicate. Yeah. And it's also uh, exactly. And, and also coming up with what that package actually is uh, and defining it and putting boundaries on it and making it so that somebody could be trained to be able to do that sales call is, is definitely a, a challenge. Um, how have you guys uh, at founder scale been able to help your, your clients in that respect? Yeah. So one of the things we coach on is uh, the ability to niche down and really find, we look at everything that they've sold their clients. We do some customer analysis and say, what did they sell? How did you get to them? And how can we really niche down so that when you bring on a salesperson and when you do marketing as well, it's in this niche. So the broader it is, the more it speaks to nobody, right? Uh, if you're a mm. marketer, if you've been in marketing, you know, like if it speaks to everybody, then you're probably not mm -hmm. going to get anywhere, right? You want to pick the title and person and role and location and problem you're solving. And the more you can put a point on that, the better you can market whatever solution it is. So we're always coaching on niching down and making sure that the capital that they're allocated is in a niche space. But hey, if anything comes inbound, take what you want inbound. But if you're spending money, um, you need to you need to focus those dollars. You don't have the you probably don't have the money to actually properly market and sell into all those different spaces uh, that the founder can can speak to. Mm. Well, and and then um, and make it worth the the salesperson's while so that they're actually they can be successful and and drive revenue and 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 show that they're absolutely absolutely able to help grow the company uh, you know very 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 important yeah um now that we, now we've been talking a little bit more about sales uh what about the marketing side so the, the marketing side is not taking orders but they are uh they're doing a lot of other things how does the marketing team and founder scale how do you guys help set up then potentially this a uh, non-founder salesperson to, to really help grow the business? Yeah, so everything we do starts off with the numbers. So we really get into the budget and flip the script. So what we found was a lot of founders went out and jump in feet first and spend money, you know, maybe with a full service agency or they think SEO is going to work, right? They they think something's going to move the needle and find out that those, those terms and those actions are not synonymous with revenue, right? They all have a place, but oftentimes they don't know exactly how it fits into the puzzle. So what we do is we flip the script and we start with the budget. We start with, you know, all the things that an agency or um, a CFO or somebody's going to ask, like, what's your budget? All these common questions. We start with those numbers and we get their CAC, their customer acquisition costs. We get their budget. We coach them on what percentage of revenue should be spent on budget. So instead of them trying to justify spending money and it just coming out, of you know a pool we actually flip it and say this is the percentage that most companies in your space are spending this is what you need to budget for and if you're not spending it then you're probably not getting in front of enough of the target audience that you need so we start by flipping the script and getting into the cac the numbers the budget and really planning that out so they have a really clear view then we start to activate and decide how could you spend the money uh, from a marketing perspective, and how's that going to drive the result that you're looking for? Yeah, yeah. I remember a long time ago in a land far away, I uh, I uh, was doing some help with a friend of mine, and uh, he was the founder of an interesting company. And he, uh, he basically said, Guy, all you need to do is get me in front of a customer, and I'll be <laughs> able to sell him. <laughs> That's it. No problem. <laughs> That's it. And, uh, and I said, um, 
And I said, well, what does that customer look like? It doesn't matter. Just get me in front of anybody and I can sell them. <laughs> and so I, uh, I said, well, let me pull out the phone book and let's find a couple people here you can sell. <laughs> right. And then I think he finally understood the, the point of, uh, you know, segmentation and, and targeting. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I, maybe I'm just going off on a story that, uh, that sticks out in my mind, but <laughs> I'm sure you have some other horror stories like that as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's a really good example where you're just like, well, listen, I'm going to get you on the phone with my mom here and I want you to close her, you know? <laughs> and it's like, wait, that's not, you know, it's like, and, and it's in, it's in, you know, kind of, it's a little bit facetious, right. But you're trying to drive home the point, right. That you said of, you need to know who your audience is. And if it's anybody and everybody, you it's, you don't have the budget to market to anybody and everybody. That's really what it comes down to. Um, cause we see this all the time. We'll, we'll talk with companies and they say, well, we're national. And I look at their data on who they sold to. And I'm like, well, actually 90% of your clients all came from within 30 miles of, of your headquarters, right? It's from your networking. So, and you don't have the budget at this size to market nationally. So why don't we just market to your target audience where you could also run into this person at an event, right? And now you have two touch points. You know, you could call <laughs> them and, and invite them to another event you're going to with other founders. They, now you have three touch points, you know? So there's just a lot that goes into what you said of getting in front of the right target audience, you know, to help that person close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you uh, uh, typically work with uh, B2B uh, startups or technology startups or where's kind of your sweet spot? So our sweet spot's kind of interesting in that it's mostly two to $20 million revenue clients and they're founder led in the organization. They're wanting to scale past themselves. So that's a little bit unique. Um, and as far as vertical, the only thing we don't do is anything where somebody just swipes a credit card, you know, strong, mm -hmm. heavy e-commerce. All of our clients have what's called a considered purchase where the, the, you know, the buyer is making a purchase and does want to talk to a salesperson at some point. So think about this, you know, in a B2C environment, if you're going to sign up for a premium level fitness or gym, you know, gym, and you're paying $150, $180 a month, and you're signing a one-year contract, you probably want to talk to another human. Um, on the B2B side, you know, we have clients that work and sell all the way up to like Fortune 1000 companies. And so they're longer sales cycles. So I would say the most common client has a sales cycle, a considered purchase where they want to talk to a human. Other than that, we're pretty broad in who we work with. Um, it's more that horizontal niche of helping the founder grow past themselves. Mm. And how do you, uh, and so it, when you're, you're talking about a highly considered purchase, which uh, makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, and it is very different than, than a low consideration, kind of a grocery, kind of a consumer package goods. So in a high consideration, maybe B2B, what is the, what's kind of the biggest challenge that they have? Is it more generating awareness? Is it uh, getting leads or where, where is, uh, where do you see their, their biggest challenge? Yeah, the biggest challenge we see on the B2B, especially in professional services, is most of the founders that start those companies were experts in that industry. So they were the expert, they were able to sell themselves. And then at some point, they probably even did implementation, right, in the, in the early days. And then, and then maybe they start to get other people to implement. And they're still one foot in sales and marketing and one foot in implementation. And at some point, there's a transition that has to happen. They either have to get uh, usually a co-founder or somebody that's really has skin in the game to come in and run sales um, or have the capital to put somebody, you know, very experienced in that role that can, can drive those sales so they can focus on implementation if that's what they love or vice versa, right? They need to get somebody that's a COO that can run implementation so that they can focus on building the sales team. So that transition alone can be very complicated because it's capital intensive, or you're talking about giving up equity to get the right person in, which is also a challenge. So that's one thing is, you know, they were the expert in that area and, you know, the other challenge we see is because they were the expert, they sold mostly through their relationships and making the transition from the relationship of the founder to a sales and marketing organization that generates its own and closes its own deals without the founder is, is a big leap. We, we say it's like jumping the grand Canyon. And, <laughs> and a lot of people think it's, you know, more of like jumping over a puddle. They're just going to hire a few key people and it really doesn't come down to that. So it's, it's a pretty big transition that can take multiple years 
and a lot of capital. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Those are some of the of challenges sense. we see on the B2B side. Yeah, just just a few. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's They're complex. Easy to... That's the challenge, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, now you mentioned uh, uh, in the uh, teaser here about community. Tell us what you meant by that. Yeah, so a lot of people, you know, we get a common question around like, what's the new normal? What's the next new normal in marketing? What's coming? And I think, I think one is already hit, right? Every, everybody's talking about AI and, you know, generative AI, ML models, machine learning. And I think we're going to see a, a continued automation and integration where that just makes everything more efficient. Um, you know, a person who could crank out X number of articles can now crank out 25% more or better or longer or more robust, right? All kinds of different aspects on that generative AI. But I, my prediction, if I said kind of what's coming down the road and, and a long-term prediction, and we'll see if this works out, right? Predictions are always fun like that is as it gets easier and easier to generate more social content and AI generates more of that and can communicate more. Um, I think we're actually going to see the pendulum swing back to where we're just so saturated with all of this messaging that we're going to come back to communities. You know, mm. you're going to, you're going to want to not see, and I, I mean, I already feel it myself and I already see it with some of the founders we work with. Those things end up a lot of times are end up being bots talking to bots. And there's lots of data that shows this and a bot doesn't buy our fractional CRO service, right? They don't buy uh, a $200,000 marketing implementation. Bots don't buy that stuff. They're not making the purchases, at least not for a while. Um, so what we actually see is most founders are driving revenue through the communities that they're in, you know, they're in the AMA and they're meeting other people, you know, the American marketing association, they're in entrepreneur organization. And so I think, um, eventually we'll just be so inundated with all the messaging. A lot of that's, it's just not going to work anymore. And we're seeing a lot of that now when we, um, uh, when we start to see kind of the response rates on LinkedIn, right. Post COVID, uh, pre COVID, the response rates of, Yep. Um, cold email. Before that, it was the response rates of how many people actually answered their phone. So it just goes from channel to channel and gets harder to stay in front of people. And eventually, I think it will be back to the community. And that's where you'll go for a lot of your input. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And even uh, as much as I try not to get text messages, um, you know, now I'm getting inundated with marketing text messages. And, and uh, so I, th I think you're right. You know, the, or each of these channels kind of goes through this growth phase and then mature phase, and then it falls off a cliff and it doesn't seem to work anymore. And, and we are inundated with content. And, and, uh, and nowadays you can kind of tell the content that was written by a, a bot or an AI or whatever versus a content that really has a little bit of punch to it. And uh, and may and I don't know maybe that AI is is helping on the search engines, but it certainly isn't helping on the actual real people that want to find out you know information about your company or whatever. Yeah, and that's one of the things where you know when we work with the founders that we have that really closed a lot of their business through networking, and then they want to make this leap, they want to jump this chasm all the way over to sales and marketing. I'm like, well, you got to remember, like people still buy from other people you know, mm. especially when they're doing a considered purchase. So really the sales and uh, the marketing that you're doing is to support the conversation that you still need to have. You still need to get in front of that other human and have that conversation. So I think, you know, that's one of the things is this needs to be more of a supporting role in a lot of cases, not necessarily um, the panacea of leads that you might be imposing onto whatever channel that is or, or want from that channel. Um, and so communities really drive that home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, you answered then kind of my next uh, new <laughs> normal question and uh, or you preempted it anyway. And and I, I kind of think you're right. I think there is definitely something about getting back out in front of people face to face and um, and being able to then have that conversation that hopefully leads you leads them down the funnel to get to, uh, you know, get down to that, that conversion. So uh, with that, uh, what do you, what kind of advice would you give a new up and coming marketer uh, that wants to get into the industry? Ooh, advice. Um, I would say, well, at Founderscale, like personal growth is a key part of our culture. So we're big on, you know, 
bringing people on that want to grow, that want to learn new things. And so what I would say from an advice perspective is probably the same thing I, I share with a new team member that comes on board with us is I tell them, if you don't know where you're going, I can't help you get there. <laughs> and so I think for new marketers, knowing what they want to achieve is can be difficult, right? When you, if you get out of school or you're just, you know, or in the early days, you may not know what you want to do yet, but you probably need to pick a direction so that somebody can help you get there. There's lots of people that want to help you and want to see you succeed as a marketer, especially another marketer. So if it has to do with getting in a certain industry, but maybe money doesn't matter as much, you know, somebody can help you get there. If you know, you want to be a top marketer and you want to make a certain amount of money, you know, somebody can coach you and tell you, well, you'll probably never see that amount of money in these areas, right? Here's the different levers you can pull and where you can go into marketing to make, you know, 150,000 a year. Um, so I think really just, if you don't know where you're going, I can't help you get there and neither can somebody else that, that would like to help you. So, you know, pick a direction, uh, go there fast because you can, you can always pivot after that. Yeah, that sounds like a, uh, and I like that. It's so true. And, uh, but it definitely sounds like a Yogi Berra ism. <laughs> He's got a, Is it? so many of them just like that. <laughs> I need to go visit Yogi Berra isms because I haven't read that book yet. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that, absolutely. He's, uh, uh, he said something like, uh, if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. And, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> something like that. I don't I know. I might There's have heard a... that in the past. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, well, uh, uh, Josh, thank you uh, so much. Any uh, last words of advice that you'd want to give your uh, give founders and other listeners? Yeah, I think the last word of advice is it's it's always cheaper to spend your marketing dollars in a spreadsheet first. So get to know those numbers before you spend your own money. Oh, I like that. Uh, you've got a couple of good ones. I like the, uh, you know, the jumping across the the Grand Canyon versus jumping across a puddle. And uh, I like, I do like spending money on a spreadsheet. It's, uh, it's very yeah. fulfilling. Way cheaper. And you can do lots Way of creative cheaper. stuff too. Lots of conversations come out of it. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So uh, Josh, thank you so much. Uh, so glad you were able to participate today. And uh, so where can people go to find out more about you and your company? Yeah. So you can go to founderscale.com. And if you would like, click the contact us button and just ask for me. I'm happy to reach out. And uh, if you're local to Atlanta, reach out. Always happy to get uh, coffee. Absolutely. And uh, so founderscale.com, founderscale.com, Josh Sweeney. Uh, thank you so much. And otherwise, uh, please stay tuned for many other videos in this series of the backstory on marketing. And if you want to, please visit marketingmachine.proirelevant and dot com, uh, marketingmachine.prorelevant.com to download excerpts and even the first chapter of my book. And if you like this episode, please rate it, rate it with five stars. Thank you very much. Josh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.